community of Houston, Texas. This is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational spiritual community providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress now with Rev. Howard Caesar. It is Black History Month, and we as a ministry have chosen to devote our worship services today uh, to recognizing and celebrating black history. I think in, in ministry we like to turn to uh, stories about people that uh, have faced adversity and challenges and difficulty and in, have been able to endure, have been able to rise up above the circumstances that they have met with, uh, the trials and tribulations, the tragedies, that. Um, the various things that we come to face in life, and some seem to be more extreme for some than, than others, and it's something to be admired, and it's inspiring to hear uh, about those kinds of stories. And in Unity, we find that it's important to really provide a, a positive message uh, that is uplifting and inspiring uh, so that people feel good uh, about themselves and about life and have a sort of a tool to take with them. And so today, uh, we'll be... Um, Unlike any other day, it will be uh, geared towards seeking to inspire you in various ways. But to start out with, um, I have to say, when we look at black history, you know, specifically the history of the African American in these United States, um, it, is, it is sad, and it is certainly something that one cannot be proud of in terms of the horrific, horrific way in which a whole race was treated, humanity to humanity. Um, brought from their homeland, made into slaves. Uh, that's history. That's the reality. That's the fact. And we can read and have read about the horrors of the ships and the conditions and of, you know, families that were brought across the ocean and, and parents and children all separated and uh, bought and gone to different places and, and the pain of that. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that aspect of black history. Um, but I, I do ask forgiveness of African Americans, of how it was that many of our ancestors treated your ancestors. Uh, it's nothing to be proud of, and it is something to be forgiven for, and it is something to move above and move beyond, really. Um, although racism exists today in various ways uh, and places and people, uh, hopefully it remains vastly reduced and that progress is being made and that people are waking up to the idea that we really are all one family. You know, um, we're not all exactly the same. We were not meant to be the same. Uh, we're not meant to look the same. God made us different externally for a reason. I have personally studied to some extent the realm of what is called spiritism. Spiritism is uh, where one engages with those beyond the veil, those on the other side, uh, sometimes enlightened beings that pass on messages of truth through a medium. And uh, some reading that I've done actually was a work that was done in which there were hundreds of mediums, reputable, that were asked a, a body of questions. And, um, and that the response uh, was consistent. And one of the questions that was asked that there was a consistent answer for was the question asking those beyond the realm why we have people of other races on Earth. And uh, the answer came back consistently from hundreds that basically God wanted humanity to have the opportunity to learn to look beyond externals and beyond differences and beyond appearances. And that one was to get past perceptions on an external basis, beyond what the mind often does to put us in separation and, and dwell on differences, but learn to live from the heart. That was a message, for what it's worth, it meant a lot to me, it made sense, uh, so realize that we're really all one family, always have been, and that part of being on earth is to look past appearances and realize that the same life force that is God moves through all of us. We have the same creator. Now today I'm going to share with you four heroes. I want to celebrate the contributions of four of my um, 
African American heroes in history and in time. And uh, they may not be exactly yours. I don't have time. There are many, many more, of course. Uh, mine may not be the same as yours. Uh, but these are people that inspired me and uplifted me. And they've been with me in various ways, spoken to me, touched my heart. Uh, in most instances, they had things that they had to overcome. And I admire immensely uh, where they rose to from the history or their past or their early beginnings. And so um, I share with you four today. And um, I have great admiration. They're not in any particular order. And I want to start with a man named Howard Thurman. And uh, he was an amazing, charismatic minister, uh, really established himself nationwide and internationally. In fact, he was a minister. He was a philosopher, an educator. He taught and lectured at over 500 institutions around the world, wrote more than 20 books, all about spiritual discovery and inspiration. He was one who left the past behind and was trying to bring people together. And uh, he was about developing a worship experience that drew people from all lines and backgrounds together. His father had died when he was only seven years old, and so he knew what poverty was about. He had to emerge from difficult uh, conditions uh, to make a life for himself. His first pastorate was a black Baptist church in Ohio. Later, he moved to San Francisco and became the co-pastor and co-founder of the newly formed Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples. You get that? The first for all peoples. It was the nation's first really interracial, interracial church congregation. And then in 1953, he accepted the position of dean of the chapel of Boston University, which was an unheard of position for a black man at that point in time. But he had become known nationally and internationally as one of the, the great uh, pastors of his era. And this, he was labeled that, actually, by Life magazine. He also served as the professor of theology at Howard University in Washington, DC. And one of the things he got to do as he became famous like this was he traveled to many places lecturing outside the United States, abroad. He met people like Tagore and Gandhi and other uh, people of other traditions. He met Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims. And, and being a black Christian minister and pastor, he was often asked to explain the connections he had to Christianity based on some of the dark past of Christianity and how how African Americans had been treated by Christians. And so he was often grilled. And he would make a careful distinction in answer to those questions. And his distinction was between Christianity and the teachings of Jesus, and that he identified with the teachings of Jesus and not necessarily everything that Christianity had done and been a part of in history that needed correction in many, time, in many instances. And so in 1935, he was serving um, as chairman of a delegation uh, that was a pilgrimage of friendship to other nations. And so he was um, leading as chair a group of students to meet other students in other countries, including uh, India and Burma and Indonesia and other places. And uh, he was grilled on this question oftentimes by people of other traditions. Here's a, a black African-American, and he's a Christian. He's a, bringing the Christian message. And so one particular Hindu uh, pinned him down, invited him to coffee uh, alone between the two of them. And, uh, and he, he, he said to him, he said, you know, more than 300 years ago, your forefathers were taken from the western coast of Africa as slaves. And the people who dealt the slave traffic were Christians. And um, the name of one of the famous British ships, even, that was taking slaves back and forth, or, or going back and forth, was called Jesus. And uh, he said, the men who brought the slaves, captains of ships, were Christians. And this, this Hindu went on and say that there was a newspaper clipping that one of his students had been to the States and had brought back uh, that told about a, uh, a worship service that was going on and that the minister closed down the, surface, uh, the worship service or recessed it for uh, a time so that members of the congregation who wanted to could go join a mob. And once the individual was killed, they returned and, and took up their worship again. And so he... He pointed out this to uh, Howard Thurman, 
and was saying that Christian ministers quoted the Apostle Paul in some distant verse as justification to sanctioning slavery. All this. Anyway, he said, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm a Hindu, and I do not understand. And the conversation lasted for five hours between them. And again, he really made that distinction. It was the basis of it between Christianity and the teachings of Jesus. Now, this guy was brilliant. He was a genius. Uh, his, you should read his readings if you haven't, Howard Thurman, um, because he truly loved Jesus. He was a follower of Jesus. But he knew that Christianity, or in the name of Christianity, mistakes had been made. His grandmother was a slave. Uh, he knew about these things. His writings were beautiful, inspirational, taking people beyond the past. His whole mission was to get out of the past and move forward. And he challenged the people to move from their heart and to go inside where all peoples, all cultures, and all faiths can become as one. In one of his writings, he had wrote, written many poetic writings, and, and one, a portion of one, I'll just read, just to give you a feeling for his energies, and, uh, which were, he said, there is a sense of wholeness at the core of man that must abound in all he does, that marks with reverence his every step, that has its sway when all else fails, that wearies out all evil things, that warms the depth of frozen fears, making friend of foe, making love of hate, and lasts beyond the living and the dead, beyond the goals of peace, the ends of war, this man seeks through all his years to be complete and of one peace within and without, to be of one peace, the spirit within. He was one of the great pre preachers of the 20th century. He was a spiritual advisor to Martin Luther King, Jr., uh, co-founder of that first interracial, interracial, interracially uh, intercultural church. He always gave a message, message of hope to all faiths coming together. One of my heroes, Howard Thurman, I do like his first name. <laughs> so, <laughs> my second hero is Maya Angelou, one of my heroes. Uh, amazing soul. She rose above early challenges in her life as well. Um, she was fond of unity. It's one of the reasons uh, my heart goes out to her. I'll never forget her seeing her on TV with Oprah being interviewed and saying a turning point in her life was when she was reading one of the main textbooks of unity called Lessons in Truth. And in there, she found a line that said emphatically, God loves you. And she took that so deeply that she wept right there on the scene on TV. And um, she, that's, she was a woman of heart, a woman of inspiration, uh, a woman who felt the message of God, felt God in her, and was motivating her uh, in all she did. She was born in, in St. Louis, Missouri. Her parents divorced when she was three. Uh, she and a brother lived with a grandmother in uh, the rural areas of Arkansas. At age seven, she was visiting her mother in Chicago and was, um, Maya was sexually molested by her mother's boyfriend. And uh, she was too ashamed to tell anyone about it. Uh, but she finally did confide in her brother. And uh, then later, the, the, an uncle killed the man that had molested her. And she somehow took that on as if she had caused that by her words actually spoken and, and shared with her brother. Not that her brother had told anyone, but just the fact that she put the words out there. As a result, she was so emo emotionally traumatized by that that she stopped speaking for five years. Not another word came out of her from the time she was age 7 to 13. She dropped out of school in her teens to become San Francisco's first African-American female cable car conductor. Then she went back to high school again. She became pregnant in her senior year. She was six, age 16 in her senior year. Um, and so she gave birth to a son, and she uh, left school to pursue the difficult life of a single mother of age 16. Eventually, she became a writer uh, of song lyrics and poems, and then authored books. And, and the book that really put her out there was a book that was about her life. And it was called, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. It received critical acclaim. And almost instantly, she became a national figure. Um, people got the depth of this lady and the message that she had coming from her heart. And there was a huge international audience that uh, emerged as well. She's a good friend of Oprah Winfrey. And, um, 
I just, uh, I just think the world of her, and, and without saying too much more, um, some of her writings included, and I'll just give you a couple of quotes. Uh, from her writings, she wrote, if you are always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. <laughs> she wrote, and perhaps you've heard this one, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I love that one. And lastly, the onus is upon us all to work to improve the human condition. Perform good deeds, for this is truly the way to battle the forces of entropy there at the work in the world. The composite of all our efforts can have an effect. Good done anywhere is good done everywhere. One of my heroes, Maya Angelou. Next, one of my heroes. One of my heroes was George Washington Carver. Now, this is a man I loved everything about him, everything I read, everything I discovered about him. He was so close to God. He demonstrated a connection with God. God spoke to him every morning. He contributed to humanity in numerous ways. He left his past to make a contribution. He was great. And I learned about him at least 40 years ago, and I've always held him close to my breast as a representative of an individual who was able to walk and talk with God and really demonstrate in a, in a fashion that was an inspiration. He was an American botanist and an inventor, and uh, his birth is not even necessarily known. They put it at about 19, or 1860 or 1861. And anyway, he started his life as a slave, and uh, he experienced the bloody struggle between free soilers and slaveholders. And his father was a slave, and uh, he worked on a nearby farm, and his father was killed um, as a slave shortly before Carver was born, while he was in his mother's womb. And Carver, was, when he was still a baby, he became kidnapped by night riders, that he, his brother, and his mother were all kidnapped and held for ransom. And before they could be rescued, the, the stress of it all, his mother died. And um, a German farmer named Moses Carver traded a $300 racehorse to be able to purchase Carver. And uh, so he was orphaned and put in the custody of a white guardian, a German farmer. He was not allowed to attend school because there were no schools that would allow him in, being his color. So he had to take responsibility for his own education to find a place. And he did then attend a school for black children that was some nine miles away from the residence of his um, guardian. And so every day he walked nine miles there and nine miles back, he and his brother. His brother quit after several years, but he kept going until age 17, 18 miles a day walking. He felt education was important. He then went on to complete high school, but there were some stops and starts and spurts, and actually he didn't complete high school until he was in his mid-20s. But then he went on and graduated from Iowa State College of Agriculture with a master's degree in agriculture. He accepted an offer from the great African-American educator Booker T. Washington, uh, an invitation to teach at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And Carver, by this time, had become an expert in the study of fungi and cross-fertilization uh, and things like that. And through the years, Carver gained a national and international reputation, so much so that people from other countries would send questions to him and uh, refer, to, uh, refer to him. People from Russia and India and Europe and South America knew about him and would ask questions relative to farming and agriculture. Carver had a deep desire to help the Southern farmers rebound from the ravages of the Civil War and also the years of the soil depletion from crop after crop of cotton. And so he was convinced in the idea that the answers could be found in peanuts and in sweet potatoes. And he was a very spiritual man, and he prayed fervently to God every day that God would reveal to him the secrets of the universe. And one time, it was his first request, God, give me the secrets of the universe. And he told his friends that God replied. And this is what he said, quote, little man, you're too small to grasp the secrets of the universe. I will show you the secret of the peanut. <laughs> and he went on from there. His research at Tuskegee, Tus Tuskegee Institute resulted in the creation of what is said to be more than 300 uh, products 
from peanuts. And I've heard everything from uh, over 150 to over 300. But as I like to say, if you get 50 products out of a peanut, you're, you're doing well. <laughs> you know? So, and then he got over 100, no one disputes this, uh, over 100 products out of the sweet potato. So he got up every morning early to talk with God, got up at dawn, and in intense prayer, he would reveal, uh, pray that God would reveal to him the secrets in the flowers and the plants and in the soil, even in weeds. Everything had a message and could speak to you. He said uh, he, he did these things so that he might help put more food in the bellies of the hungry, more clothing on the backs of the naked, and better shelter over the heads of the homeless. He was about giving, helping. He said, anything will give up its secrets if you love it enough. Not only have I found that when I talk to the little flower or to the little peanut, they will give up their secrets, but I found that when I silently commune with people, they will give up their secrets also, if you love them enough. He said, God is going to reveal things he never revealed before if we put our hands in his. He said, no books were ever taken in the laboratory with me. He said, the thing that I am to do and the way of doing it is revealed to me. I never grope for methods. The method is revealed at the moment that I am inspired to create something new and for good. Without God to draw aside that curtain, I would be helpless. He had that connection. He always spoke about loving the beauty of the earth and, and God's handiwork in all things. Beautiful soul. He talked about spiritual evolution and growth of the individual and the way that he said it, quote, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the, with the striving, tolerant with the weak and the strong, because someday in your life you will have been all of these. I love that. He was a mentor to students. He wrote, oh, how I want to help them get the fullest measure of happiness and success out of life. I want them to see the great creator in the smallest and apparently the most insignificant things all about them. How long, how I long for each one to walk and talk with the great creator through the things he has created. He was a scientific genius. He was an incredible soul. He is one of my heroes. My fourth hero, my fourth hero is one you all probably know and maybe your hero as well. It is Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. She too had to overcome uh, personal challenges. Uh, she is a person obviously that has made a difference in the lives of millions of people around the world. Uh, one of the reasons, or many, I have many reasons, but I love the fact that her openness to the other spiritual paths and to going outside the box and having the courage to be able to address that, bring people in, uh, expose people to other thoughts than a, a strict, narrow, uh, rigid way and expand and open people. Uh, she had the boldest to not worry about the critic and uh, what people would think, but to go with what she was guided to do based on the God that spoke within her. She was born of an unwilling mother. She spent the first years uh, on her grandmother's farm in Mississippi uh, where her mother, while her mother looked for work uh, in the north. And her, her grandmother taught her to read at an early age. And actually, Oprah, um, at age three, was reciting poems and Bible verses at local churches. Uh, at age six, her world changed. She was sent to Milwaukee to be with her mother, who had now gotten a work uh, a job as a housemaid. And in the long days when her mother was gone and absent and she was there home alone, um, she was repeatedly molested by male relatives. And that abuse lasted from age 9 until 13. It was emotionally devastating for her in her life. She tried running away, and when she was found that she was caught running away, they put her, in, uh, enrolled her in a, a juvenile detention home. And when she went there, she was turned away because it was full. But she decided then at age 15 that she was going out on her own, and she left. Admittedly, she was sexually promiscuous. She gave birth to a baby boy who died in infancy. Uh, she then went to live with her father in Nashville, Tennessee. And he was a strict disciplinarian. He, was, he provided a more secure environment and, a, and, and a, uh, some 
some boundaries and things, and Oprah flourished. It was what she needed, and she became an honor student, uh, winning prizes in oratory and drama. At age 17, she won Miss Black Tennessee Beauty Pageant and was offered a job at a radio station in Nashville. And then she won a scholarship to Tennessee State University, where she majored in speech communications and performing arts. She left school early, however, because she was given a job to be a reporter and anchor at a local television station. And then she became and was hired away to Baltimore, where she became a co-anchor. But then she hosted her first talk show, uh, People Are Talking. Um, and when she did uh, there in Baltimore, she really um, you know, showed her skills. And in 84, 1984, she was invited to take over a faltering uh, morning TV program in Chicago. And it was called AM Chicago. And when she took it over, it became the hottest thing in Chicago. And it expanded from one half hour to an hour show. And they renamed it the Oprah Winfrey Show. In a matter of a year, it went nationally. And it was made up of sensational, you know, stories and people and outrageous guests and all of that. But from the 90s on, she shifted followers followed her guidance and moved in the direction of an emphasis on spiritual values, healthy living, and self-help. And her program, her program became ever more popular uh, than it had been. And had many of the authors and, and guests that she had were in alignment with unity itself, uh, have taught here, have spoken here, friends of unity. And so we, we love the fact that she represented bringing an expansive idea, a progressive message uh, to the world, and many of these same ideas that we're all one. Uh, and a, a huge contribution. So she was named really one of the 10 or one of the 100 most influential people of the 20th century by Time magazine. She's a tremendously prolific, uh, I mean, well, not only prolific, but philanthropic is the word I was looking for. Um, and she was really the first um, black African-American woman to become a billionaire. Uh, but she's never, uh, yes, I mean, that's a great accomplishment. So today, Today we honor black history and all the people that make up the um, black, black history really and so powerfully have influenced black history, people who have really engaged with God in one way or another, risen above um, and been a vessel for good in this world. And I say thank you. I hope you join me in honoring um, all of our black American history um, and saying thank you to all of our brothers and sisters in our family of humanity. And truly, may we all embrace one another in love and oneness going forward. God bless you all. Hi, I'm Reverend Howard Caesar, and I'd like to personally invite you to celebrate Easter at Unity of Houston. Easter is a very spiritual time. It's about renewal, resurrection, and celebration. And at Unity, we have a wonderful celebration planned for you and your family. We have outstanding music, which includes a special trio and our choir and more. We also have an Easter extravaganza, which is planned for the children. And those festivities include an egg hunt, face painting, games, a petting zoo, and even a visit with the Easter Bunny. So tell your friends, bring your family, a happy Easter from Unity of Houston, and I hope to see you on Easter at either our 9 or 11 a.m. service. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. Unity is inclusive, welcoming people of all walks of life in dignity and love. We believe that love, strength, and goodness dwells within you. May we all live in unity with God, humanity, and all of God's creation. And remember, as Reverend Caesar says, life is meant to be good.